Today's video is sponsored by Bespoke Post, which is a monthly membership club delivering amazing boxes of top shelf goods from under the radar brands. Every month, Bespoke Post introduces members to cool new products, outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and more based on a preference quiz that they fill out. They even ship live oysters, which might be pretty enticing since we're coming up on those sweet, sweet summer months. Bespoke Post is free to join and you can skip a month or cancel at any time. As an example, here is one of the fantastic items that they have. This is the Weekender bag. It's a high quality canvas bag that you can load up. Guess what? When you go away for a weekend, easy. Each box has about $70 in retail value, but just costs a fraction of that. You can preview the box before it ships and decide if you want to keep it, swap it, or skip the month for no charge. Another example is this beer making kit box, which contains everything you need to guess what? Make beer. That's right. There's the big jar. There's all of the hops. There's this tube for something. But everything you need is in the box. It's a great treat for yourself or as a gift for someone else in your life. Either way, Bespoke Post is a very cool deal for my viewers. Right now, you can get 20% off your first box by clicking the link in the description below and entering the code top 10s 20 at checkout. Or just head to bespokepost.com forward slash top 10s 20. And now today's video. Winter storms, those marked with snow, ice, sleet, and whiteout conditions occur from early fall through the late spring. Today's weather forecasting technology allows for early and usually accurate predictions of such events. Such was not always the case, and even when it was, warnings were not always heeded. Winter storms present dangers which include snow blindness, falling ice, drifts which can bury vehicles, and even houses, hypothermia and many others. Other dangers are added by humans who inattentively poison themselves with carbon dioxide, fail to dress warmly, or unwisely expose themselves to hazardous conditions. Here are 10 of the worst winter storms in American history. In some of them, ample warnings of nature's impending wrath were available. In others, the inclement weather appeared as a surprise. But all of them were harsh reminders of the power of nature and its ability to reduce humanity to near helplessness. Number 10. Thanksgiving Blizzard of 1971 Thanksgiving Day is a fall holiday and the start of the Christmas shopping season, marked by when Santa Claus arrives at the end of the traditional Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade. So technically, storms which occur over Thanksgiving weekend aren't winter storms at all, but for people living across Pennsylvania and upstate New York in 1971, the distinction was moot. New York and Pennsylvania endured the worst Thanksgiving Day storm in history in terms of snowfall, on that holiday. The storm began on Wednesday, the day before the holiday, then, as now, a major traveling day for many Americans. Across Pennsylvania, up to 30 inches of snow fell before the storm abated late the following day. With temperatures hovering around 30 degrees, the wet snow weighed down branches and power lines, causing outages, thus disrupting cooking as well as travel. Snow plows were unable to begin clearing the roads until after the snowfall abated, and travel throughout the region remained problematic through the weekend. Most of the Pennsylvania Turnpike, as well as several stretches of the New York Thruway, remained closed stranding travelers and disrupting traffic. Number 9. April Blizzard of 1982 Easter week in New York is remembered and celebrated in the 1948 film Easter Parade with Judy Garland and Fred Astaire enjoying a stroll with fellow New Yorkers down Fifth Avenue, the ladies showing off their new Easter bonnets. Easter week 1982 was somewhat different. On Tuesday, April the 6th, people in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area found themselves in a raging blizzard which paralyzed the area. Airports shut down, stranded travelers swamped hotels and motels, automobile traffic ground to a halt. The snow came Came down quickly, bringing New York City to a near standstill. Both New York's Mets and Yankees had scheduled their season openers for that day. Neither took place. Rather than a white Christmas, it looked as if the approaching holidays of Easter and Passover would be covered with a blanket of snow. Fortunately, warmer temperatures returned quickly, and by Easter Sunday, five days later, most of the snow was gone, with what was left just filthy sludge. The storm occurred over two weeks following the beginning of spring, at least according to the calendar, a time when New York's average daily high temperatures normally approached 60 degrees. Number 8. February Blizzard of 1983 February the 10th to the 12th saw a major blizzard along the route followed by I-95, one of the busiest traffic corridors in the United States. Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York City, New Haven, and Boston were all buried in a storm which acquired the nickname The Megalopolitan Blizzard of Philadelphia, set a record for snowfall on February the 11th with 21 inches falling in just 24 hours. Some areas in Virginia had over 30 inches of snow. 
The New York metropolitan area had snowfall totals ranging from one and a half to two feet, with over 17 inches recorded in Central Park. Airports from southern Virginia through New England closed, rail travel stopped, and motorists found themselves stranded on the interstates and other roads. Streets and highways alike remained snowbound for days after the storm, which caused an estimated 46 deaths. Road crews attempting to clear the snow from Virginia to Maine found themselves hampered by abandoned vehicles, downed tree limbs, and other detritus from the blizzard, which also featured a phenomenon known as thunder snow or thunderstorms within the blizzard. Some vehicles were abandoned on interstate highways, including the Capitol Beltway surrounding Washington, where multiple jurisdictions took steps to clear them off roads, in some cases prosecuting their owners for their transgressions. Number 7. The Superstorm of March 1993 The March 1993 superstorm was so huge it ranged from Honduras and Central America to eastern Canada. Snow in the Florida Panhandle is rare, especially in March, but the storm delivered 4-6 to six inches across the area, spicing it with hurricane force winds and frigid temperatures. As the storm moved across the eastern United States, it knocked out the power to over 10 million homes, dumped snowfall which exceeded 4 feet in some regions, and led to over 200 deaths. The 1993 superstorm was the first in which the National Weather Service could provide computer models which accurately predicted the amounts of snowfall several days in advance. The accuracy of the models allowed the northeastern United States to declare states of emergency before the snow began to fall. Nonetheless, many failed to heed the warnings and adequately prepare for the events, especially in rural areas which were without electrical power for several days and even weeks. Winds exceeding 100 miles per hour swept across the eastern seaboard from Florida to Nova Scotia. Cells within the storm generated tornadoes, which added to the destruction. In all, 26 states, most of eastern Canada, Cuba, and the North Atlantic were impacted by the storm. Every airport in the United States had their schedules disrupted, and those east of the Alleghenies from Tampa to Halifax, Nova Scotia, were closed at some point between March the 12th and 15th. Number 6. Valentine's Day Storm of 2007 from the Nebraska Plains to the East Coast, as far south as New Orleans to New England, Valentine's Day 2007 was the midpoint of a massive winter storm. It produced severe tornado spawning thunderstorms in the south, blizzard conditions in the Midwest, heavy ice storms in the higher valley, and more blizzards in the Northeast from February the 12th over the next five days. In the United States and the two Canadian provinces most severely affected, 37 fatalities were attributed to the storm. Snowfall was so heavy across New York State, the National Guard was called out to assistance removal. Pennsylvania saw a 50-mile backup with traffic at a standstill on I-78 in Berks County. Some motorists were stuck immobilized by the storm for over 24 hours, some even longer. In Philadelphia, Valentine's Day was marked by huge sheets of thick ice sliding off roofs to crash to the streets below, forcing police to close off numerous streets. And New York's John F. Kennedy International Airport airliners froze to the ground at the gates, blocking their use by arriving flights, which were forced to wait on taxiways. Some passengers were forced to wait for as much as 10 hours in aircraft which could neither go to the gate to unload nor take off. Ironically, in Washington, D.C., the House Subcommittee on Energy and Air Quality cancelled a scheduled hearing on global warming on February the 14th. Number 5. Midwestern Blizzard of 1978 for three days in late January 1978, the Ohio Valley and the Great Lakes region endured a blizzard which proved one of the most severe winter storms in recorded history. The barometer fell to the third lowest level ever recorded in the mainland United States above the subtropical regions. The combination of the low pressure system, heavily laden with moisture, and the polar jet stream created staggering amounts of snowfall. In Michigan, up to 52 inches of snow fell, piled into much higher drifts by winds which reached up to 100 miles an hour. In Ohio, the blizzard was the worst to ever impact the state, closing all major highways. The National Guard was called to rescue those stranded in snow. Calls went out for citizens with four-wheel drive vehicles to assist transporting emergency personnel to hospitals and clinics. On January the 26th, the second day of the blizzard, an Amtrak train was immobilized in Indiana when snowdrifts, some of which reached over 20 feet in height, blocked the rails. In Michigan alone, over 100,000 cars and trucks were abandoned on streets and roads unable to move. Wind chills reached minus 60 degrees in Ohio, where 51 out of the 70 total deaths caused by the storm occurred. The the entire length of the Ohio Turnpike, 241 miles, was closed for two days, an unprecedented effect of what became known as the Great Blizzard of 1978. Number 4. The Children's Blizzard of 1888 January the 12th, 1888 began as an unusually warm day in the Black Hills, then part of the Dakota Territory. The region contained small, isolated communities. The schools were one-room schoolhouses where children walked to their classes. The respite from the cold and snow of the preceding December led to most residents, including schoolchildren, not wearing the heavy winter garments usually needed for that time of year. By noon, the temperature fell and the snow began, driven by rising winds. Mid-afternoon saw steadily worsening conditions. Some teachers released their classes 
hours earlier, in the hope that their charges could get home before the storm worsened further. Others kept the children in their schoolhouses, hoping they had sufficient fuel to keep the buildings warm through the storm. Late afternoon saw the full-fledged blizzards presenting whiteout conditions, 60 mile per hour winds, and snowdrifts rising above 15 feet. Over 230 people died in the blizzard, which was over by the following morning, and which affected Nebraska, the Dakota Plains, and eastward into Minnesota. In South Dakota, it is remembered as the schoolhouse blizzard, as well as the children's blizzard, in remembrance of the over 170 children who died either trying to get home or in schoolhouses when fuel ran out and they froze to death in that frigid night. Number 3. The Great Appalachian Storm of 1950 also known as the Storm of the Century, 1950's Great Appalachian Storm began on November 24th and raged across 22 states before it dissipated six days later. The storm featured hurricane force winds, heavy snows and ice, and record low temperatures from Alabama north to New Hampshire east of the Alleghenies, and from Tennessee through Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia on the western side of the range. It began the day after Thanksgiving, bringing temperatures to record lows in Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. As it moved north, it produced more record lows, accompanied by high winds, which eventually exceeded 100 miles per hour in New Hampshire. The winds and cold created blizzard conditions on the western side of the mountains and lake effect snow on the Great Lakes. On Saturday, November 25th, the Ohio State University was scheduled to play football against Michigan. Despite a temperature of 10 degrees, 30 mile per hour winds, and snow falling at a rate of 2 inches per hour, the game was played anyway. Michigan won. New Jersey recorded the highest wind gust in the state's history during the storm, 108 miles per hour. At New York's LaGuardia Airport, wind-driven storm surges breached the control dikes, closing the airport due to flooded runways. Connecticut saw coastal flooding, which washed away railroad tracks and roads. In all, the Great Appalachian Storm caused 383 deaths and almost $70 million in damages, about $816 million today. Number 2. The Great Lakes Storm of 1913 In terms of the weather conditions it produced, the Great Lakes Storm of 1913 was a winter storm, but it took place in mid-autumn, beginning on November 7th and raging for three days. A combination of unseasonably cold temperatures and hurricane-force winds, the storm caused the sinking or grounding of 19 ships on the lakes, stranded nearly two dozen others, and killed more than 250 people, most of them sailors. Blizzard conditions struck the lake ports of Duluth, Cleveland, Chicago, and Detroit, as well as many smaller ports. The heavy snow earns the storm the nickname the White Hurricane. Despite warnings of severe gales on the lakes, many ships continued their voyages rather than attempt to take shelter in ports or anchorages. On Lake Huron, wind gusts reached 90 miles per hour. Lake Erie recorded wind gusts near 80. On all the lakes, the high winds created rogue waves, wreaking havoc on ships and shore facilities. The shorelines and cities along the lake suffered blizzards which produced over 20 inches of snow in Cleveland, similar totals in Buffalo and Erie, and power outages throughout the region. Damaging ice storms occurred in Pennsylvania and New York. The Great Lakes storm of 1913 remains the worst natural disaster in the history of the Great Lakes. Number 1. The Cyclone Blizzard of 1888 in March 1888, approximately 25% of the American population lived in the region between the Virginia Capes and Maine and east of the Alleghenies. On March 11th, that region was pummeled by one of the worst storms of any season of the year in all of American history. The major cities of the eastern seaboard were paralyzed by heavy snow, storm surges driven by hurricane force winds, ice and sleet, and drifts which reached heights of 50 feet and beyond. In New York City, the drifts were so high they blocked the elevated trains from operating, stranding more than 15,000 commuters. The New York Stock exchange closed for three consecutive days since few were able to get to their place of employment. The East River froze over between Queens and Manhattan. The blizzard was credited with inspiring New York City officials with replacing the elevated trains with a subway system, as well as moving gas lines and water mains underground. New York was not the only city to suffer a significant number of deaths to the storm, which exceeded 400 throughout the Northeast. But it suffered the most of any city, more than 200, including Senator Roscoe Conkling, who collapsed while walking in Union Square, developed pneumonia, and died of complications a month later. In Brooklyn, a snowdrift in the Gravesend neighborhood was measured at 52 feet. Houses were buried, their occupants trapped within. The storm sank or otherwise wrecked more than 200 ships in the Atlantic and Chesapeake Bay, and more than 100 seamen and their would-be rescuers died. Throughout the area affected by the storm, frigid temperatures no higher than the low teens in most places added to the misery and amplified the danger. The cyclone blizzard of 1888 became the standard against which all winter storms have been measured ever since.